Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I begin my remarks this morning by joining our President in expressing both our condolences and sympathies to the people of the Bahamas, the Caribbean, and indeed those who at this very moment are still not sure whether this extraordinary hurricane may also affect their lives within the next few hours. The pictures of the devastation that we have seen come out of the Bahamas over the last few days, which I actually with my family just visited over 15 months ago myself, are heartbreaking. They are extraordinary in the level of devastation and they speak again to this extraordinary moment that follows a disaster when both people within the country but also we as an international community are called upon to respond unbureaucratically in solidarity fast and with a view to build back better. I'm very pleased to also note that my colleague Mark Lokok is, as we meet here this morning on the way to the Bahamas, that we in the UN family, including UNDP, are already in deployment mode on the islands and are ready to work with the people and the governor of the Bahamas to essentially pick up the pieces after this extraordinary moment. It's always a, a reminder of how when we meet here in New York and we discuss the state of the world and we also meet as an executive board and talk about the United Nations Development Program, how we need to always bear in mind that when we aggregate, when we talk about global averages, the reality of development, the reality of a failure in development, the reality of a disaster such as the one we have just been witness to again, is absolute in the individual sense. And it is here that I often think is the best reference point for thinking about the work of the United Nations, of the UN Development Programme in the context of the SDGs. 2018 and also much of 2019, because it is now September and much of 2019 already lies behind us, has been in some respects from the point of view of the strategic plan, the delivery on the promise that UNDP has made on the commitment of resources, a good year. We are on track in terms of our strategic plan, as I shared with you, particularly in June, also with the um, annual report. We are also increasing the resource base with a 6% increase in revenue over the year 2018 compared to 2017, which is not an insignificant signal at these very challenging times. We also accomplished that increase in uh, revenue with a record in delivery, a five-year high in delivery. So from a basic point of view of having the UN development program engaged on the ground in the 170 countries where we work, I am pleased to say that the indicators in terms of our engagement, in terms of our delivery, in terms of financing <clears throat> are looking positive. In that same period, over an eight-month window, we in fact also had to invest significantly in replacing an entire leadership structure. Not only significant shifts at the top level of the organization, but also at the next tier. The leadership in our country teams, both at the level of resident representatives and in the last three months also completing an entire recruitment exercise for the next generation of deputy RRs has been completed. More than 220 staff have been selected, deployed and are in place to help us run our program in this next generation UNDP mode. All this while in fact confronted with the world, and this is where I want to simply create that context again, that feels extremely stressed, challenged politically in terms of conflicts, in terms of tensions, but also in terms of that sense of common purpose that in this particular building here has always been the fundamental reference point. Talking about the future of development, talking about the role of the UN's development program and assessing its performance against this backdrop sometimes is not an easy thing to do. We define in the UN as member states extraordinary goals, ambitions, collective visions, and the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda certainly is one of those. And today's board meeting tries to address this in three respects, and I would like to in particular thank the President of the Board for having highlighted and elevated one element, which is the role of the private sector and also financing of the SDGs in the context of this agenda. It is integral to every single country's reality. We often talk about the private sector as if it is some external actor um, that we in the United Nations have to learn to work with. The reality is in each one of your countries, the private sector is the reality of what people depend on. It is the sector that creates the jobs. It is the place in which new technologies can be deployed, new businesses, new services, new platforms, new markets emerge, and therefore, 
talking about the private sector in the context of our work as the United Nations Development Program is fundamental to being able to serve countries who are both trying to address how the private sector can be part of achieving the SDGs and particularly this morning on the issue of financing. Because quite clearly, without private capital, private investment and private finance, the realization of the SDGs in virtually any economy across the planet is simply delusional. That is a fact that you can look at from many different angles. But it does not translate into simplistic solutions. And I want to begin this morning's presentation about uh, my report back to you as executive board and as administrator by looking at one particular challenge that begins with what you in the resolution on reform refer to as the integrator role. Why has the notion of integration become or gained such currency? And what does it mean? Because to many of us it means many different things. And we have in UNDP tried to understand over the last year what is it that we can offer to countries and what is it that countries are particularly looking for when they talk about integration. The first thing is it is the whole of government approach. The challenge of managing government and public policy and governance in a nation has always been a challenge with sectors and different vantage points and interest groups. How can we strengthen the ability of smart public policy of effective governance, of good rule of law, which are all fundamental conditions for a functioning body politic, but actually, interesting enough, when you talk to the private sector, are often many of the preconditions that they define for investing in development. So we are talking here about something that, whether you're public or private sector, actually is a set of points of convergence. And it is into that arena that we have tried with UNDP, both in the past, because this is not something that has just been invented, but try to refine our understanding of what it means to offer to countries effective advice and support in terms of that integration function that government has to play, that we as a UNDP integral part of the UN development system have to bring to the development equation and how we can develop these instruments. Traditional tools that we've already had and that you're familiar with are the MAPS missions, the development finance um, um, in, in, uh, um, DFIs, I've forgotten now what the I stands for, but it is, um, it's one of the tools that we use, um, which allows governments to look at the whole financing landscape, both public and private. We are currently also working with UNDESA uh, and many others on integrated national financing frameworks to better enable governments to look across the full spectrum of what it means to mobilize finance in support of investment in the SDGs and the implementation of national strategies. We have identified four areas in which we think UNDP will play a significant role in terms of being able to assist with the integrator role. First of all, new policy and programming, the next generation UNDP policy and programming tools, and I will not take much of your time today to enter into the details here, but as you have heard in the June board meeting and also in our strategic plan, this has been a key part of understanding how development, the future of development, both in terms of challenges, inequality, poverty, climate change is changing that development landscape, but also how new opportunities, the digital economy, that global trading platform and marketplace into which even small entrepreneurs can venture into is evolving. Secondly, data and analytics, whether it is the multidimensional poverty index, whether it is the human development index, whether it is the work that we do in terms of understanding who is being left behind, whether it is women, whether it is girls in education, whether it is the question of how do rural populations become part of that rapidly evolving digital economy. Can connectivity, can the internet, can broadband be a tool for inclusion or will it exacerbate inequalities? Will it actually cement exclusion? These are some of the fundamental challenges that governments across the globe today are confronted with as that technology revolution, as that digital economy unfolds before them. And I'm very grateful that Anna Riot is here because she is in fact one of the members um, that is helping in an advisory group right now guide the work on SDG impact, which in many respects is also looking at that emerging economy and how we can provide better advice to governments and therefore facilitate the kind of investment flows that she will speak to a little bit later. And financing therefore takes a very central role and I'll say a few words about that in a moment, but it is the third track because SDG implementation integration must ultimately be premised on a very simple understanding. It is not to fund every single goal in an isolation. It is trying to understand how one dollar, one yen, one rupee that is invested in achieving a goal 
out of the 17 delivers multiple returns on investment. That integrated planning, that integration approach that looks at the challenge of access to energy on the African continent as also a poverty reduction tool, but also a climate and energy tool, and also a public health tool in terms of pollution. These are the kinds of logics that create both developmental priorities and economic and financial rationale for investment. They change markets. That has already begun to happen with the world's energy markets, energy technology markets. We are witnessing before our very eyes right now the changes that are taking place in mobility, in technology that we took for granted for the next 30 to 50 years, and it may not be with us anymore, namely the combustion engine in 10 or 15 years. These are the revolutions that emerge out of a different logic of looking at development investments and therefore financing. And the fourth area in which UNDP is trying to strengthen its integration approach offered to countries is in innovation and learning. In our economies today, too much happens that is simply not transactable through government as an institution alone. It is the entrepreneurs, it is the startups, it is sometimes the small and medium scale enterprises that are the backbone of an economy. And I just learned this on my visit to Japan last week when the Tokyo International Conference on African Development, the seventh one, was organized in Yokohama. And I learned that in Japan, three and a half million businesses are registered. 99.7% of these businesses are small and medium scale enterprises. Just to remind ourselves that this is not a phenomenon that is applicable to developing economies. In fact, small and medium scale enterprises in Italy, in Germany, in Japan are the backbone of the economy. And today when we talk about the private sector, and Ahuna and I both were in Dakar, Senegal, when President Macri hosted the Emergence Dialogue earlier this year, we talked a lot about what is it that people often overlook when they talk about the private sector, for example, in Africa. First of all, we see some large enterprises. We saw them at TCAT 7. But actually, much of Africa's economy is transacted through the private sector, small, medium-scale enterprises, farmers, people who run shops, services, the startup economy that we now witness. Our tools in UNDP to address this integration challenge are, in a sense, the spearhead with which also countries, governments, and all the actors in the development arena need to address these issues. I hope that in what we are now developing and the partnerships that are emerging that you will also have read about in our annual report that we presented to you just uh, a few months ago, will provide you with more appreciation of how diverse but also of how strategic this work is that UNDP is today offering to countries. And it is obviously in high demand. A part of that is also investing in that capacity that we need. Um, also, fresh perspectives and expertise and skills. So the UNDP accelerator labs that I introduced to you at the beginning of the year and said we would have them up and running by August, I'm pleased to report that virtually all of them in 60 countries are now at the stage of going operational. They have brought in fresh perspectives, expertise, and also knowledge that allows UNDP to complement and complete the offer that it sees many countries looking to us for. Now, let me briefly move on to SDG finance and also the private sector, because some of that I have already touched on in the first part on integration. As I mentioned at the beginning, in the United Nations we continue to look at the private sector as something that either is fundamental to development or is extraneous to the fundamental role of governments in guiding and shaping development. That discourse in many ways is an anachronism. The reality of economies across the world is that the private sector is there. The question is, do we have a government, do we have a public development agenda that is focused on Agenda 2030, the future outcomes of a 2030 uh, set of indicators, and the private sector, the economy, the money, the jobs, the businesses, the entrepreneurs, essentially focused on yesterday's economy, because that is where the money is being made. This is part of the dilemma of how we can recalibrate the incentives, but also the outlook and the confidence of investors, of business people, large or small, in a different kind of economy. Whether it is the low carbon economy, whether it is a less unequal economy, whether it is an economy in which pandemics or cybercrime do not threaten the stability of our economies will depend a great deal on public policy, smart public policy, regulatory frameworks, governance, the rule of law, core elements of our work in UNDP. Mm -hmm. But in an economy, in a setting, and in a perspective about the future of development that is fundamentally different 10 years from now than 10 years looking back today.
It is here that I think we need to understand that public finance will remain an integral and critical part of shaping development paths, national development paths. But the kinds of investments we are talking about, whether it is on the African continent, where over the next 40 years, 1.4 billion people will have to be connected to some source of electricity generating infrastructure, or whether it is the decarbonization of the global economy, or whether it is food security and the ability to feed 10 billion people without diminishing the natural resources on which we depend, soil and water to actually grow the food, these are transformations that require extraordinary investments, including and in particular from those who are actually at the front line of this economy, the farmers, the car manufacturers, the power industry, but also the consumers. And it is here that we are looking today at the private sector as being an integral part of that transformational capacity of a nation, of an economy, and ultimately of a 10 billion people market in 2050. We have learned a lot in the UN, in the kind of networking that we do across the 170 countries of how governments have approached this work. And I think the way we look at the future of the private sector in development is not in the way that we perhaps tried to do it in the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s, where the mantra or the paradigm of privatization was the equivalent of trying to address the shortcomings of public policy or the constraints of government. Clearly, in today's development context, that is an oversimplification. Public policy remains fundamental, not only to ensure public goods, but also transparency, accountability, inclusivity, addressing the issue that is now tearing apart society and nation after nation, namely inequality. This is not the age of a retreat of government, but it is the age of a different framing of government public policy and its impact on the private sector, on the kinds of markets it can create. And the digital finance domain is one in which we are currently at the request of the Secretary General with the high level task force on digital finance and the SDGs, trying to appreciate quite how dramatic these shifts will be. Natalie, who will join us in a moment, is a living example of that rapidly emerging economy of the future that can either make digital finance platforms inclusive and therefore something that is available to all, or the privilege of the few, which very often has been the story of new technologies in development. So it is into this context that we work as UNDP to support governments not to replace public policy or public goods or the rule of law or governance through markets and the private sector, but to make sure that public policy leverages, incentivizes, facilitates, de-risks. These are the verbs that we are using today, the context into which the private sector can redirect its resources, can recognize the markets of the future, and therefore is both able and willing to invest in these transformations. This is not theory. It is the story of development. The problem for us today is, and that's why we have this SDGs and 2030 agenda is that we are running out of time. These transformation processes cannot be trickled down. They cannot be at the behest of the most conservative association of private sector producers of a particular technology. We have to advance faster and in a more radical sense of transforming economies than ever before in view of the kinds of challenges and threats we have and the time windows that are closing on us. It is here that our work also with SDG impact um, that we will hear hopefully a little bit more about later, becomes so central to helping governments and national economies to leverage the power of their domestic financial markets, of the population who saves money through their financial institutions, the private sector and the entrepreneurs in their national economies, and building on that, attract foreign direct investment as well, but on terms that are different than if foreign direct investment is the only game in town and the terms are those that we have so often seen in the past, which were more extractive and exploitative by nature than actually investing in national development. This is also why UNDP advises many of the countries in which we work on how to borrow and on what terms to borrow from what sources, because we are in the midst of facing another extraordinary debt crisis right now. But as I mentioned once to you before, according to Christine Lagarde, Lagarde unprecedented in the nature of this debt crisis that is emerging. It is more corporate debt than public debt that is actually creating extraordinary exposure and vulnerabilities for well over 40 countries already today that are facing debt-stressed conditions.
So again, we have to be conscious of the way that borrowing capital and involving the private sector does not create other liabilities in the development process. Let me move quickly on to the last part that I want to cover. And much of that has been already discussed with you as a board in terms of the informals and uh, also yesterday's um, dialogue that has taken place. But I owe you as administrator an update um, in month nine of the year 2019 as to whether the institutional backbone, the platform of the organization continues to evolve in line with the commitments that I and my leadership team have made to you in moving UNDP forward as an efficient, effective, transparent, accountable development program of the United Nations. I'm pleased to say that in many of the fundamental indicators that you would look at if you were an investor and were in a, in a financial market and perhaps looking at UNDP as an entity in which it is either worth or not worth investing, our basic financials are sound. We have completed a second year in which we have re-established a balanced budget. We have the highest delivery in five years. We have the highest net assets that we have been able to um, establish within the UNDP balance sheet. This is sound, safe, and stable uh, foundations for managing the organization. Our efficiency has also continued to improve. The management efficiency ratio is actually well beyond the target that was set. We are now at 6.69%, and 87% of our total expenditure is actually on program activities. This notion that a UN development program or any UN entity, by definition, is an extraordinarily expensive operation simply does not hold up to the test of comparing it to many others. And I want you to um, be very much, feel very much welcome to deepen our dialogue on this. We have also been able to finish 2018 with the 14th unqualified audit in a series. And I mention that because it should actually be normal that this happens. But we sometimes forget that this organization operates every year 4,500 projects in 170 countries. It actually has 17,000 employees. It transacts salaries for another 30,000 in the UN system. It transacts every day in over 110 currencies. This is an extraordinary large operation. It is also taking place in many countries where sometimes even the fundamental institutions of government are no longer functioning in the context of civil war post-disaster. And yet we are able for the 14th year to deliver to you, to those of you who invest in the work and have trust in UNDP, an unqualified audit. I think this is worth mentioning because it actually is part of the management reality that so many contribute to. On human resources, I've already spoken about the significant investments we have made in the next generation leadership at various levels of the organization. We introduced in this year 2019 the People for 2030 strategy, nine different tracks of reforming the way that the fundamentally most important asset of UNDP is actually managed as part of the value proposition of the institution. Again, no time to share with you more details, but they are available to you. And I hope that in the coming months, you will see how quickly on these nine tracks, we are changing the face of being both a staff member of UNDP, but also of UNDP being an active investor in its greatest asset. On funding, the data you have covered yesterday, so I will not spend more time on it, but just to say that on core and non-core, 2018 was a reassuring year. Let us remember, this was a year of enormous change in the UN, UN development system reform, many changes in UNDP. We lost 120 of our country managers. And yet our teams actually have delivered. And many of those who have contributed to the work of UNDP over the past year were able to not only maintain their commitments, but actually to increase them. And for that, I'm also extremely grateful. On core funding, we have arrested for the second year running a decline. In fact, a small increase, but because the increase in non-core was quite significant, over 200 and I think 50 million dollars, the percentage is still one of 12% core, 88% non-core. But as I mentioned, 6% increase in overall um, revenue available to the organization is reassuring. Um, our expanding partnerships also in diversifying those who are investing with us in 2018 gave us some uh, cause for optimism, particularly the international financial institutions and also bilateral development finance institutions are increasingly engaging with UNDP, both in the development and development crisis context. Uh, particularly, I want to highlight here KFW and the World Bank. But let me also recognize the countries who in 
2018 uh, increased their core funding. Uh, among them, Sweden, Norway, Japan, Germany, Netherlands, the Republic of Korea, and Luxembourg. And I want to thank them because at that moment, that signal, but also the investment in the ability of the institution to deliver on its core functions, because this is in part what core funding is for, um, was absolutely vital, and it remains vital. And clearly, um, you know, in all this, let's say, positive outlook on trends and developments, I still feel, as a CEO of this organization, deeply uncomfortable at the ratio of core to non-core. This is not a viable proposition for running an organization that is objective, mission-driven, results-driven, and accountable to a board when, in fact, this proportionality remains like this. And it is a challenge for us. And yes, uh, I wish the numbers were different, but not yet. Um, but I think we are hopefully making good progress. Let me end by mentioning one more thing that I had also promised you in the strategic plan and had also um, announced to you in the January um, board meeting, which is the digital UNDP. We have embarked on a 24-month journey of radically transforming how UNDP will work in this digital context in which we today are able to both function and operate and provide advice and support to countries in this transition. Digitization, which is essentially transferring the organization onto digital platforms, and digitalization, which is the context in which our financial economy, our trading economy, will change and how the advice that UNDP and the competence it must develop here to help governments manage these transitions are now an integral part of our work. Our chief digital officer has been appointed. The organization is engaged in a full mode, full throttle forward transition. And I hope that over the remaining 18 months, we will at every board meeting be able to demonstrate to you what a digital UNDP transformation means in reality. We do mean business here because if we don't, we will go out of business. This is my conviction. Finally, Mr. President, let me also thank the board for taking under consideration at this meeting the new country uh, program documents that are being presented for Angola, for Liberia, and for Sierra Leone. I commend them to you. They have gone through the due diligence process. They have been looked at by the executive board, and we very much look forward to being an integral part of the development journeys of these three countries over the coming years, including in the context of the new development cooperation frameworks of the UN. And also to thank you for considering the extension of our work in Madagascar and Yemen. I simply want to add this morning that, um, as some of you may have heard, I visited Yemen for about five days in July. And I must say it was one of the more um, sobering experiences in my two-year tenure at the helm of UNDP. Sobering because I have rarely witnessed an implosion of a country so systematically across virtually all indicators of an economy. And to see a population that is defined by its culture, tradition, and pride being reduced to absolute desperation and hopelessness. I encountered people who continue to believe that there is a future in Yemen, but everything that we see right now is pointing in the wrong direction. We are there as the United Nations, and I have to say it was a moment of pride to see how the different tracks of the UN's work, the political peace building part, the humanitarian response, and our development engagement are working hand in hand. It is another way of looking at integration at work. It is a live example of what it means to be there as the United Nations and also as UNDP at a moment when this nation faces its worst nightmare, at least in living memory. And therefore, I commend to you also that you support us in this continued engagement. This may not be the perfect plan, but it is the most extraordinarily important commitment we can make to this country and its people at this time. I thank you, President, I thank the Bureau members of the Board, I thank you as Executive Board members, and I want to particularly thank our partners and my staff. Um, as we look to the end of the year, another three to four months to go, this Executive Board meeting is an important milestone in a remarkably intense and fast journey forward. I want you to um, both have a sense of confidence in where we are heading, at the same time interrogate and also question much of what we're doing because this is part of the way in which we can improve what we're doing. And if I don't spend a lot of time speaking to you perhaps about things that are going wrong here, it is because I'm trying to provide the big lines with which UNDP is trying to address the future of development and its role in the UN development system. An article in Foreign Policy recently about a project in Russia. 
Let me say that every single project where we have an indication that something is not going right needs to be at the top of our list of priorities as management. And we take this extremely seriously. And we have looked in this particular case at the storyline over six years. We are engaged with some of you who also you know, govern the GF, which was the funding source of this, with our partners in Russia. And I just want to assure you that in looking at sometimes where things don't quite work, perhaps because we made a mistake or perhaps because some of the assumptions about what would happen in a legislative context in a country did not materialize, this is part of development. 4,500 projects, my appeal to you is I try to present to you an organization in its totality rather than just in its individual bits. But the dialogue has to be at both ends of the equation. Thank you very much. Just to make the transition back into this particular focus of this morning, we wanted to present to you a brief video on an initiative that, again, is very interesting. It speaks to the interest of the private sector, which many of us often underestimate in working with the United Nations to contribute towards solutions. In this case, um, individuals in the advertising industry approached us about a year and a half ago, particularly two individuals from Australia, and wanted to experiment with something that had never been done before, which is to look at the advertising that uses images from animals in their product advertisement and approach these companies and say, if you use an animal in advertising your product, would you consider contributing 0.5% of your advertising budget towards something called the lion's share, which would be a fund that we have asked the United Nations Development Program to be the custodian of in order to raise financing for investment in conservation, wildlife conservation, habitat conservation, and therefore make the private sector part of investing in both the protection and conservation of biodiversity. It was a bold idea, and frankly speaking, many of us thought it may not actually come about. Extraordinarily, the response from within the world of business has been phenomenal. We are now presenting to you a quick update video on where we are with this. It has already won a prize simply in terms of the idea breaking new ground. And let me just give you a sense. This is not a few cents. There are billions of dollars invested every year in advertising and PR. If just that percentage of a few that we could attract to this were to be realized, this fund could within a few years generate anywhere between 10 to 100 million dollars through this particular partnership to invest in conservation. And as we established this fund, we did so also with other UN entities in order to make this a UN platform alongside the private sector. I commend to you the lion's share. Thank you.